back for lunch. Um, I'm um, going to continue with part three. I just want to refer back to one slide from part one. Um, I, I took a look at it over lunch, and I, I was saying that it had a mistake in it, but it's actually correct. Um, so this was just the definition of uh, continuous functions. If I look at the preimage of O2, it's these two red pieces. So this red piece stops exactly at this vertical alignment, and this is a um, uh, closed interval here, but it's open on this side, so it's the set itself is neither open nor closed. And that's the reason for the discontinuity. The, the set actually that you're looking at is the union of these two. That's the pre-image of O2. Anyway, so that one's correct. I just wanted to point out. Um, there's also some smaller corrections, which I'll try to make tonight and upload for the final slide. Okay, so we have part three, which um, goes on for an hour and a half, and then part four, so we'll have a half hour break. And the afternoon part is um, about dynamic environments, so the morning part was just um, introducing basic path planning ideas, some of the mathematical concepts, some of the basic methods for doing path planning. Now we start thinking about the problem of um, dynamic environments, which was the, uh, the task that was given to me by the organizers. So they invited me to give a tutorial on motion bonding for dynamic environments. So um, I did my best to um, figure out what that means and, 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 and put it all together for the, next, uh, for the next three hours for these parts. So. Um, I believe you got a homework problem, right? Anybody make progress on that? Busy eating lunch. Let's see. So, so remember the problem was um, I need to have an infinite sample sequence, and I want it to be dense. I want it to be dense. Does it even say that? Okay, it doesn't even say that. Um, find a metric space. Um, subset of Rn, and you can just use the standard Euclidean metric, doesn't matter. Um, so that the dispersion, which is radius of largest empty ball, is infinite um, regardless of how many of the first k samples you use, right? Whatever k is, infinite dispersion. But when I include all the samples, it immediately drops to zero. So a very simple example is just take x to be the real numbers and take the sequence to be just any dense sequence in the real numbers. So for example, remember I said the set of all rational numbers is dense, right? So I can just, the set of rational numbers is countable. So I can just make some way to count them all that makes a dense sequence. And so any finite subset that I pick is going to have infinite dispersion because any finite subset that I have of the sequences is going to have unbounded intervals on either side, right? So I can get arbitrarily far away from my samples. So it always has infinite dispersion for every k, but when I use the entire sequence, it drops to zero. So that's the answer for that. Sorry, I hope that was amusing. Um, it's actually a very interesting property. So when you go to um, sampling-based motion planning under differential constraints, which I covered at the end of part two, um, this property, this kind of behavior happens in a somewhat unexpected way when you're sampling the function space of controls. So you're essentially doing a, a different kind of sampling. It's uh, essentially infinite dimensional space sampling. And it's harder to spot this kind of behavior. But it occurs for those problems. And I think it's very interesting. So that's why I brought this up as an example. All right. So sec uh, part three of this tutorial is called um, dynamic environments colon uh, modeling issues. So I just want to talk about modeling issues, how to describe problems in dynamic environments, and then for the final part, I'll talk about methods that I've found in the literature and how they're related and how they use some of these models that I'm talking about now. So let's think about it. A robot moves among static obstacles. Let's say the, uh, the dark blue um, polygons here are just uh, static obstacles. And then I have some moving obstacles or moving bodies. I, just, um, I didn't make an animation, but imagine the red triangles are moving around. I want to think about how to model this, right? So that's the kind of thing I want to look at, the baseline problem. And um, one of the first things that's going to become important immediately is the time axis, right? So if, if things are changing over time, if obstacles are moving over time, we're going to start having time parameters coming in. So this interval t that we referred to last time is going to become a lot more important now. Um, I like to have a thought experiment, so I'm going to keep using this example over and over again to kind of understand some of the limitations. Um, uh, so this is um, kind of a, I said a thought experiment. You have a, um, a goal where you'd like to be for the robot, 
and then you have this door that just moves up and down. Right? So, so somehow we don't control the sliding door, and I'm trying to figure out where the robot should go. So when the door is in the out position, there's a doorway here, or it's on the wall, I guess I should say. They call it a door, a sliding door, but you know, it looks more like a sliding wall. So that it makes a doorway downward when it's up, and it makes a doorway up here whenever it's, uh, the wall is down. Um, <laughs> so imagine making a kind of demon. Um, I, I always like the, um, the Maxwell's demon um, uh, thought experiment from uh, thermodynamics. So this is like a motion planning demon, if you want. Um, imagine there's a demon that keeps moving the wall. So if the robot wants to go down this way, it starts to go through the doorway, and then the wall just moves down and blocks the doorway. So that the robot would then have to go up there, but then the demon just um, goes to the um, switches. Let's see, yeah, switches modes. So as soon as the robot's coming down, it moves to this mode. If the robot moves back up, it'll switch back to this mode. So you can keep going back and forth, essentially trapping the robot, right? Um, so a lot of the methods we'll be talking about in the fourth part do some kind of, let's say, iterative replanning. But um, it's very easy to trap them with this kind of demon. So that's something I just want to point out. And I'm going to try to pick the simplest kind of example that illustrates this behavior, right? So just simple sliding door. And imagine you get to play with the door and try to always lock the robot. Not very hard, right? Um, one thing that's interesting, though, is that if this position of the wall follows a Markov chain, so maybe it has an up and a down mode, and it switches back and forth according to some probabilities that are non-zero, then you're in a good situation, right? Then you just wait by whichever one of the two you like, and eventually you're going to win, right? Assuming the door cannot close on top of you, that's another condition that I, that I did not include here. Well, this is, suppose it doesn't. It's not a completely malicious door. All right. Um, so that's an example I want to refer back to it a bit. So how to model the world? What might we try to model? I don't know, maybe a complicated shopping mall, um, people moving all over the place, all kinds of obstacles, moving obstacles, stationary obstacles. Maybe it's a person's home or an office environment. So um, in some kind of complicated environment, what kind of things do we care about? Well, uh, stationary obstacles. This is motion planning after all, so we usually want to avoid those. Um, maybe the ground itself becomes hazardous. This could be an outdoor uh, environment. And so we'll talk some about representation for those kinds of things. So if the terrain itself becomes hazardous, or at least it's costly to go up or down a hill or something, then that, that may be something. Maybe there's a lake in the way. Um, there's a lot of lakes around here, right? Right here. Um, OK, anyway, some bike humor. Um, and um, you know, there's moving people, animals, vehicles, other robots, other kind of, whatever you might have. Um, also, how do we characterize the environment, which goes back to the thought experiment? Um, is the environment friendly? Is it trying to help us? Is it hostile, maybe? It's trying to harm us. We could be engaged in some kind of game. Um, probably the most likely case is that the environment's oblivious, right? It doesn't really care what we're doing. And uh, you have to somehow, uh, your robots have to somehow survive in that. Um, there's going to be an issue of formulating the right kind of state space for these problems. That'll come up over and over again. You have that in basic uh, motion planning. You have it in control theory. You have all over what's the right kind of state space. So somehow, it should capture the contingencies that you're going to reason about, all the different possibilities. You don't have to explicitly represent them in a data structure, but you at least need to define what the possibilities are. I was thinking, well, there's a robot that you're trying to control, which has its own C space, configuration space. Could have a phase space, maybe, if you want to include velocities. What about other robots that are around? I guess they could have their configuration spaces. Um, the moving obstacles could also have their configuration spaces or phase spaces. I may make assumptions about what kind of configurations they can get into. Um, and again, maybe there's other agents. I don't know what agents are. Maybe they're uh, people or dogs, whatever you like. Um, any other kind of moving bodies out there may have their own configuration spaces and phase spaces. So these would become components of the state. Right? It's something to think about. Also, we may have just some discrete modes for the environment. And I'll, I'll give an example of that. So it's a kind of a way to make a hybrid system. You may have some discrete modes and continuous uh, space. So whatever we have, when we try to formulate a state space, we like to think, can a space of states be nicely parameterized? Remember how nicely we parameterize the space of transformations of our robots in the morning? We'd like to be in that kind of situation for uh, motion planning and dynamic environments. Also, these two things become important quite a bit. Um, what kind of predictability do we have for some of these components? And what kind of sensibility do we have? And the meaning of that is, can we measure them with sensors? 
right? So what information can I get about these components, and um, are they changing in the future? So the second question is all what I know right now, or what I can learn right now, or what I expect to be able to learn in the future when I sense it. But the first one is about um, being able to predict in the absence of any sensing what's going to happen based on the information you have right now. So these will all become very important. We're back to the same representation issues from the morning. I guess now, though, if we're dealing with dynamic environments, there's, there are a lot of real-time issues, right? So people are um, concerned about making decisions quickly, planning quickly, doing all these kinds of things. So I hope that your data acquisition and conversion into whatever representation you need is also quick, because that's going to measure into the time that it takes to do various things. Um, so that's just something to say. If it was important before, I would say, well, it probably becomes even more important now to choose a good representation, because um, um, you, you may have uh, time issues in dynamic environments. Um, this is also interesting to think about. Um, when I talk about dynamic environments, is that the same as the problem of planning in uh, partially specified environments, right? So maybe I build a map of this room, but I'm not really sure what's outside the, uh, the corridor behind Mike there, so I don't, I don't, I don't really know, right? Um, so, um, if I go and get more information eventually, it looks to me like my representation of the environment has changed. That's dynamic. But it could be the case that the environment is static, right? That the true environment is static. All of my information has changed with regard to it. So I think because of this, a lot of the methods that are used for dynamic environments could also be used for partial environments and vice versa. Of course, the difference with dynamic environments is that it seems to have more flexibility in the sense that you might know everything about the environment, but then it still changes, and you have to acquire the new information through models or through more sensing. And um, with partial environments, um, eventually you could learn everything and you're done. Right? There's nothing else to know about the environment. So that's just something to pay attention to. It just gets gradually revealed to you. So the two are related, but I think this, I think this, um, this tutorial is supposed to be more about the dynamic case, but just want to say it's related to the partial case. It's like a weaker version, I think, in some sense. There's always this nice issue, too, about what do you assume about the parts that you can't see are you optimistic that it's going to help you towards your goal? Uh, people I talked to, uh, talked to Tony Stenz, a lot of people at the Field Robotics Center, and they found very good, a lot of their the planning algorithms make use of opportunism. They, they, they assume that things are going to get better outside in areas where they can't see. Most of the time that works really well for them. They have strategies to fall back on when it's not. Um, extreme pessimism will probably make you just never want to move your robot. Um, and if you like probabilities, you may want to reason about maximum likelihood things that will occur in, in other places that you can't see. Um, also, I, I kind of have trouble figuring out what the environment is, I guess. I, I don't know, try to get philosophical a little bit. Um, you know, if, if imagine, for example, I have a robot and I, I think the environment's known and that maybe I know where the obstacles are and uh, maybe the red triangles are also not moving. They could be stationary, that's fine. And then, um, the robot, though, has a stochastic control law in, in transitions, so the future configuration can only be specified up to some probability density function. So when I imagine the possible futures, they might look like these, right? Only because of the uncertainty in the robot's configuration. So does that make, a, does that make the, um, the environment seem dynamic, then? Because my robot can't predict where it's going to go very well? Usually not, I guess, but... but, but um, quite easy to get confused. I mean, I can think of the environment as being everything outside of the computer that's running the algorithm, right, for planning it, right? So that includes part of the robot itself, including its own problems with calibration and sensing and localization, all these kinds of issues, right? So, so it could very well be that we want to include configuration uncertainty of the robot in the mix of this as well, right? And sometimes we just might have to face it anyway, but I just want to point out that it does cause something that looks like an unpredictable future simply because, and it looks as if the obstacles are potentially moving to different locations, but that's because you may become uncertain about the future and eventually you may even know, not, not know where you're at at the current time. Um, however, all these different possibilities are coupled through which true transformation was performed. Right? So um, um, if, if you can name the actual element of SE2 or SE3 that transforms you, then all of that uncertainty would go away, right? So all the moving bodies are, are, are correlated very strongly through the uh, rotation group. Um, I tried to make, I wanted, I wanted to consider the, um, um, the different extremes. I wanted to make a spectrum of predictability. So at one extreme, I thought about completely unpredictable environments. Like, would that be worth studying? Um, 
And I said, well, how about this? And here's my most, uh, my most extreme example. I said, well, I'll say, all right, um, the optical region could be any subset of R3 at any time, right? Um, I'm not sure what a robot could do in that example, right? I think the environment would just look like continuous static, and um, it's best not to move, I guess. You know, I don't know. So, so that, that caused me to think that actually the only cases we really care about are completely predictable environments or partially predictable environments. So I just want to emphasize that it might not look like it, but we always have some information that you can use to make uh, predictions. And you should look around for it. It's probably there somewhere. Because if you really have no information, you just have this, a static screen, where the static is changing all the time. You know, like all of a sudden some kind of horrible cantor set might appear as the obstacles. I don't, I don't think so, right? So, so it's, it's not going to be like that. All right. So if that's the case, then I make a kind of spectrum, like sort of spectrum here, maybe zigzags a little bit, but um, at the top of my part of these cases, that'll be probably the largest chunk of what I talk about today. Um, you could move, you could have the robot, or oh, sorry, the obstacles moving along a known trajectory. So that's the, the highest information case. Um, you could have that um, maybe they, an obstacle moves, but with bounded speed. So I have a little more information than, um, you know, complete uncertainty, right? But it's uh, weaker than the known trajectory. So it's less information than number one. Um, number three is maybe it moves according to some control law, but I don't know the input. I'm writing it as a theta, maybe like a disturbance. If you want to write it like a U, because it's somebody else's control law, that's fine. It doesn't really matter too much. Um, maybe there's a probabilistic transition model. Maybe it's a stochastic control system, but I still don't know what, um, what input was applied. These two are probably related, but they're a little bit different. Um, maybe it just all of a sudden appears, and I use a, a Poisson process to model it. Right? So um, Poisson process is what? It's a lot like, um, uh, well, one way to approximate it is to imagine uh, tossing a coin over and over again until you get heads. Right? So um, how long will that take for it to arrive? And take a coin that's biased so that it, it rarely ever becomes heads. Right? So, but, um, so we do the experiment over and over again. In the limit, you get something. You get something called a Poisson process. Um, you can get things like um, the number of heads you get should be proportional to the length of the time interval. You know, the nice properties like that. All right. So that's one way to maybe describe it. I also want to think about intentions. That idea has been around before. If I can speculate about the intention of the obstacles, that might go a long way in simplifying the model. Right? And this might sound like some weird psychological thing or something, but I think it's. I think it's quite helpful. I'll give some examples of that. And then I want to talk about game theory where uh, you know, everything's kind of hostile, I guess. You, know, you need to really be careful about, about how, what the obstacles are doing. So they will respond to you right, in some way, so that's kind of interesting. So I find some of these to be different levels or types of predictability. Let's go to fully predictable. So I have my, my time interval of interest, as I said before. I can say I have optimal at each time. I just put a time parameter on it. And uh, I just say, well, it's given for all time. Now I make something new called the configuration time space. Right? You can make it sound really cool called the space time continuum or something like that. But, but you know, just, just configuration time. I just add one more time to it, and there's none of that uh, relativity curvature nonsense going on here. I'm just adding a time axis. You don't have to worry about it, right? We're not going to be moving robots close to the speed of light. Right? So, so it's good. It'd be cool if we could. Um, so all I do is make z equal c space cross my time interval. And now every z state, or whatever you want to call it, is a configuration and a time together. So it specifies enough information to be able to figure out where the robot is precisely and what, um, where the obstacles are precisely. Here's one way you might imagine how it looks. If this is the time axis, um, suppose I have a collagenal obstacle that is translating through the plane. So it's just a two-dimensional problem in the, in the plane. It's a two-dimensional configuration space, but it's a three-dimensional uh, configuration time space. And that's probably the highest dimensional one we can visualize, so it makes a pretty picture, but we can't do much beyond that. And um, you know, if this thing moves, um, oh, what's it doing here? I suppose it's moving in um, piecewise constant um, velocities. So it um, starts off stationary, moves for a while, and then becomes stationary again. That's how it would look. And notice you have continuity along here because the obstacle does not jump to a new place. So um, 
if you start running the, the robots through the transporter beam on Star Trek, then you have uh, discontinuities in that picture there, right? So, so we don't have a, we don't have discontinuities. Um, we can then define the optical region here to be this. It's parameterized through time, so that will make an optical region that I've drawn there through the z space. So that's the z ops instead of the c ops. So that's easy enough. Maybe the, maybe these problems aren't actually harder at all. Right? Maybe I can just finish my tutorial in five minutes and be done. So I can add one more dimension, right? Let's see. Um, so I have that. Um, now there's a table. This should be. Um, I don't, I don't think I propagated my z's enough here. Sorry about that. This should be z free. Is just a complement of z op. So, so that's um, just the z part. And um, I got to have an initial state that should be a z, and these should be z's as well. So I, I start off with x's and then had a bad idea of renaming things somewhere in the middle of my making the slides. Sorry about that. Anyway, these all z's. So um, so now I have a, an initial configuration at time zero, and I have a goal region. It's a subset of z space. So somewhere in this diagram. I would like to be in some blob, right? That's, that's where I would like the robot to be. So it specifies both time and place. Um, oh, in fact, this one has a goal specified. This is a time invariant goal. It just says the goal stays the same all the time. I could just have fun and make the goal move around, right? So you just put it in this diagram. All right. Um, so my, my, my problem is to compute a continuous trajectory. I don't say path now. I say trajectory because it's parameterized by time. So all of a sudden that becomes important. And it maps into this, um, um, this Z free. And so I want it to be, I want to start off at the initial and I want to end up um, in the goal for some time, at some particular time in the future. So time parameterized path. Um, here's some more challenging cases. I'll say a little bit about these as we go. But um, what if the robot has a maximum speed bound? Maybe that's a little harder. And, um, what if a robot motion is specified as a nonlinear system? Well, you have more problems to deal with. The usual kinds of robotics problems come out. Um, but the sort of easiest case is just the robot has to move on a continuous path, but it can go arbitrarily fast. And it's not too much harder than the regular pathfinding problem. It is a little bit harder because time must go forward. And that's going to have some implications, so you can't go backwards through time. Um, so that will come out in, in part four. I'll talk about that a little bit. Sorry about the axes there. They'll be it should be Z's. I'll, I'll correct it for the final thing. Um, all right, so let's talk about bounded uncertainty now. All right, so uh, let's suppose I have a, an optical, call it a body, so it moves around now. Um, and um, it moves with some maximum speed bound. So, so maybe initially I could have some set of possible configurations for it that, that I've narrowed it down to. Maybe I know exactly where it's at, in which case that'll make a, a perfect, complete cone. That ends at a point um, because you know the precise configuration. But if at this time I don't know that, then um, starts off like this and then it just grows outward because of bounded uncertainty, right? So in other words, there's a there's a there's a slope associated with uh, bounded velocity. Does that make sense? Right? You can only go so fast when you're as a function of time. So you can only increase or decrease at a certain rate. So you end up with these cones that represent the bounded uncertainty. Um, What's neat about this is that it's a special case of something that a lot of people have done research on, and I want to point you to some literature on that, called reachable set computation. Sometimes it's really easy, and sometimes it's quite, quite challenging. In most general cases, it's about as challenging as the optimal control problem, so, which, which I'm sure a lot of you have confronted before. Um, so, but the, the way to do planning for this is, well, if I can, if I can compute these regions, then maybe I can do a worst case estimate and just keep outside of these regions and find a path that makes it to the goal nevertheless. You know, it might get lucky and that might work, or these cones might get too large too quickly and then you'll fail. So that's the, that's the issue with that. Um, you could, if they get complicated, you might try to over approximate them, but again, you end up with um, um, maybe you lose completeness altogether. You may have large conservative over approximations and then you can't uh, find a solution even when there was one. All right. So, um, but the thing, the thing that, that, that's unfortunate about this the way I drew it is that um, maybe when the t and sometime in the future here, I get some new information about where the optical is. I'd be able to narrow it down to a point. I'd like to use that. So that starts to change the way we think about what a plan even is. So if, if there was a solution from the initial time, so online information 
is not is not necessary if we got a solution using this method. But if it looks unsolvable, we may want to use sensors to get information on, on online. And then what? What do we do? Replanning, reseeding horizon control, something like that. And that's some stuff that we'll end up talking about a fair amount in the um, in the fourth part. I still want to talk a little bit about reachable set computations. And uh, one thing that kind of occurred to me while I'm preparing this, I hadn't thought of this before, is that if I want to compute reachable sets for, let's say, I have a point robot in a, in a polygon, and um, I would like to know the set of all places where it might be after some number of seconds, and this point moves with bounded speed. So it has a, a, a speed bound of 1, let's say, right? Um, you can use this beautiful uh, family of methods called continuous Dijkstra algorithm. You've heard of Dijkstra's algorithm on graphs. Has anyone heard of continuous Dijkstra? Otherwise, not, not too many, maybe, right? That's good. I'm glad the organizers know what they're doing. That's good. Um, so um, this, this method, this is a, a method from computational geometry. And what it does is it computes the level sets of the optimal cost to go function for the continuous space, but it does it in a non-numerical way. What you can do is you can figure out, using visibility analysis, anywhere inside that's visible here, I can, the, the, um, the cost to go lines, the optimal cost to go lines are going to be concentric circles, right? That's how fast you can propagate the wave, let's say, right? Um, how, how the wave will propagate with, say, unit speed. So all of these places you get to with perfect circles. But when you get to a corner, then the waves have to bend around. But as soon as you hit the corner, this is the direction it would have to go for optimal flow, then you have circular arcs here that are centered on this point. Right? So they continue uh, around this way. And uh, same for this one, same for this one. And if you have a polygon that's not simply connected, if it has holes in it, then you have to worry about how to represent the collision of the wave fronts. But these wave fronts are done combinatorially, just like that method I showed you of uh, trapezoidal decomposition this morning, where it just cleverly figures out the places where you need to make the trapezoids without doing any kind of um, approximation. This method will do the same thing. So in a very quick pass, it can, um, I believe it's in time, it can, um, it, can, it can calculate all of these, um, even for a polygon with holes, which is really amazing. So, so that's quite nice. Um, the reachable sets are very easy for this. And if it's not a point robot, but a disk robot, I guess that would work too. If it's a polygonal robot that just kind of diffuses by translation only, um, I'm not sure what happens to that. It might be easy, it might be hard. I'd have to maybe ask these people. I don't know what to think about it. Um, I think I just said, yep. Um, so, 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 so this, this might be reasonable, but um, you know, maybe this model of um, um, bounded speed in all directions is not too realistic. So maybe I'd like to have a kind of control law that expresses how the body might move, and then all I know, all I know is the control system for this. Maybe I know the body is a Dubin's car, for example. I checked, you know, I made sure the car does not have a reverse gear, it can't go backwards, and I checked very carefully, I noticed it's like Dubin's car, but there's someone driving it, and I don't know what input they're going to apply, right? So, so, so maybe that's a reasonable model, and if that's your model, that looks very, it starts to look very much like reachable set computations, as I said, in general. Um, so here's how that goes. Each obstacle has its own configuration space, so just suppose we're talking about the configuration space of an obstacle. I can move that into the phase space and, um, and then talk about, as I, as I covered some of this stuff this morning, you know, I have the configuration, the velocity, and then I have some unknown control signal that's being applied. And then if I knew the control signal, I could figure out the future state. So what we want to know is what's the set of all possible future states if you don't know what input got applied. In other words, if someone's driving the car and the car even has dynamics too, let's say, and um, we don't know what inputs they've applied, so we're not sure how they're stepping on the accelerator and we don't know how they're steering, what are the set of all places where the car could be in 15 seconds? All right, so that's a reachable set computation problem. What do you think, is that easy or hard? Kind of hard, right? So that's such a difficult kind of problem. Only easy in very special kinds of examples. Um, so we can talk about this. This is a time-limited reachable set here. We can also just um, consider them, pick a union of them for all time if you want, and then you can figure out everywhere the car could reach. Like, for example, if I go all the way over here, and I have a Dubin's car, and my Dubin's car is pointing this way, and I can't turn very sharply, I'm going to be stuck, right? So my, my, my entire reachable set for all time 
is just going to be some corner back here, right? Soon I can get far enough away to where I can turn all the way around, and I can do lots of stuff. So, um, so very interesting to think about these time reachable, sorry, these um, reachable sets, even in the case where it's not time limited and you can go on forever. Um, so calculating these is quite difficult, especially when there's obstacles. So you have to take into account all of that. And um, this is an example that has no obstacles. This is one of the, the sharpest. Looks a little bit weird on the slide, but this is one of the sharpest uh, examples I know of uh, um, of the level sets for the Dubin's car. So imagine the car starts here, and these are the level sets of the, the shortest paths that I can drive this car along. So after, imagine it moves at uh, constant speed. So where could it go? Well, it very quickly can arrive in these, but in order to get to these places, it's going to have to drive around like this and go in. So that makes a discontinuity in the level sets here, and in, in the cost to go function, and the level sets get all sort of messed up of the optimal cost to go function. So if I take any one of these level sets, that would give me a reachable set at a certain time, right? So um, this is not too bad to compute because it's only three dimensions. Um, computing it that accurately and cleanly is a little bit harder, but, but, um, but these uh, people, um, Otsuko and Parola, have done that recently. Um, so I want to say that reachable set computation is um, a very big problem in verification. You may have heard of verification. Um, people would like to know that the right behavior is going to happen for all inputs. Right? If I design a control system, I may want to know that it's going to work over all possible disturbances, which is another input to the system. Or maybe all user inputs that are given to the system. People do it in software design. Now everyone cares about verification in many, many settings. So what kind of methods are there? Well, if you have linear systems, there are some very nice clean methods based on incremental Minkowski sums. So for linear systems, you get very nice structures to represent the reachable sets with no obstacles. Um, in general, though, you're usually stuck with Hamilton-Jacobi type uh, PDE computations. And um, as you might imagine, it's Hamilton-Jacobi-Bellman equations. Um, so, so, so you're very much left with numerical PDE kinds of methods. Level set methods and things like that end up being the types of techniques that are used for calculating reachable sets in general. You can also do a Monte Carlo simulation. You can look for some of the works of these people if you want to find literature on that. I just thought if you're interested in motion planning in dynamic environments, you might want to think carefully about reachable set computations to figure out if your problem is too easy, too hard, needs to be modeled differently, and so forth. So I just thought that would be interesting. Um, also, I, I think of verification as um, anti-planning, I guess. Uh, right? Because in planning, what are you trying to do? You're trying to find a path. And in verification, you're trying to show that there does not exist a path. So it's not really, it's, if you have a method that answers yes or no to that question, then it solves both of them, right? So, so I, I don't know if there's any kind of planning, anti-planning annihilation going on, but, but, but definitely you know, people working on verification coincidentally know a lot about planning, it turns out. They just might use different terminology. So if you ever find a verification person, wherever you might work, um, um, sit down and have lunch and, and change terminology a little bit, and you might find out you have a lot in common. And they might even suggest reachable set methods for you. Um, all right. Um, another thing is these reachable sets called motion planning. Um, in our old uh, paper on, um, with Kostner on, um, on RRTs, we referred to the reach of inevitable collision. Again, if you just take from the robot's perspective, it has its own state, and um, you can just have static obstacles to make it easy. Then I could talk about this thing, XRIC, region of inevitable collision, which is the, um, um, the set of all states I can be in right now at the beginning time for which um, no matter what input I apply, there exists some time where we're going to be in collision. Right? In other words, if I'm driving a car, um, I don't know, 120 kilometers an hour in this room, I'm pretty sure everywhere in this room is inside of that uh, region of inevitable collision. Right? So those regions grow really fast as the speed goes up. So this is Q, the configuration, and this is the velocity. So if you go fast negative or fast positive, then this region of inevitable collision starts growing, right? That's kind of the intuition about it. And it's very interesting to characterize those. They're very helpful for planning, it turns out. And I'll mention some methods that, that you can calculate these kinds of regions uh, in, the, in the fourth part. But I just want to say that even for the robot itself, it's very helpful to calculate these region of, regions of inevitable collision. Um, all right. And there, there's some researchers who have worked on these things and, and developed particular uh, methods for, for computing these. Um, probabilistic uncertainty. So we did we did bounded uncertainty. We did fully predictable case. So what if it's not about sets, but just probability distributions? It should be even harder, I would think. However, maybe you can do some clever uh, particle-based or Monte Carlo sampling kinds of methods to um, 
um, to get some reasonable approximations. So, rather than bounded uncertainty, suppose that given the current state of the, ob the obstacle, I can figure out some future state of the obstacle or body. Um, X prime, XB prime is at some future time. I didn't specify the time on this, but I'm making it look like a discrete time kind of model uh, because I, because I, um, I fear continuous time stochastic models. So. Talk to Greg Trickian and read his books if you, if you want to go that way. <laughs> uh, let's see. So, um, so just keep a discrete time when we talk about probabilities. So, so where, where might the body go next? Well, I could make simple diffusion Brownian motion type models, right? Maybe they're not very realistic, though, right? I don't think I can't think of any too many bodies in the real world that behave like that, except for maybe gases. And if you're down at like some some very down to, to an atomic scale, maybe, but um, I don't I can't think of too many Brownian robots. Well, we've been doing some like that in our lab recently, so maybe I don't know. Um, and um, um, you know, maybe we can do some kind of Monte Carlo sampling or something, or particle soldiers to try to calculate where the body might go next. Um, maybe that can even be based. Um, you can use machine learning techniques and learn models for doing this. Um, speaking of doing that, um, just to find a nice example. I was on the uh, PhD committee of uh, Chiara Fubinji at um, at uh, Inria in uh, in Grenoble. And um, I remember, I, I, so, so this is the front lobby at Enria, and, and uh, anyone who's been to a lab in France knows that um, the coffee bar is a very popular area. Right? So, so what they did is they, they analyzed all the data of people walking, they captured you know, where they moved, and they paid attention to their paths, and you can see there's a lot of routes back and forth between the labs and the coffee bar. I'm not sure why those people don't go to the coffee bar, I don't understand at all. But, um, um, but, 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 but it's very interesting in that they gathered a bunch of data on that, Learned a, a um, hidden Markov model that um, that very nicely offers a lot of prediction capability for those motions, and then they were able to incorporate that into their planner, which I thought was nice, right? So that and, and one of the keys in doing that was to reason about the intentions that most of these trajectories are occurring because people most people are not wandering around like a random particle, right? They're they're going to get a coffee, so they more or less do the same kinds of things. Tons of people flow up the steps, they either know where they're going or they go to the information desk first, things like that. So, so that's quite nice. If you can figure out a very simple model, like hypothesize that the bodies that are moving actually have intentions and guess what the small set of intentions might be, then you can make nice uh, stochastic models and use those. So I'll mention a little later how that was used in the, in the next part. Um, it could be the case that um, um, even, for the, even for the robot itself, um, like, for example, maybe, maybe for the robot or maybe for the optical, you might know the optical is a Newman's car, but you might still have a stochastic model of how it moves. Right? Or maybe it's a differential drive and you have a stochastic model of how it moves. Well, then you might have a probability density function over, um, over possible future configurations then. So even if you know its intention, you know what algorithm it's running and everything else, you might still make probabilistic models, I'll say, right? So you know, it looks to, to account for disturbance. Um, this one I, I took from uh, Zoe and Trickian. Oh, 03, was it that long ago? Wow, okay. Yeah, that's right. That was uh, type A. No, All right, uh, let's see. Um, hybrid system model. Um, so there's another possibility. Is maybe you can confine the unpredictable parts, or the partially predictable parts, down to a very small number of modes. And if you can do that, almost like the intention that I was talking about, but if you can do that, you might be able to make a nice hybrid system model where there's different layers to the configuration space. So it just changes through different modes. And then you just have a simple Markov chain here that describes the transitions. So sometimes you might have a modeling situation like that. Let me show you a little example of that. So maybe I just have a couple of doorways here. And I notice that doors open and close from time to time. And so maybe there's just, um, what does that make? Four possible environments. Either both doors open, both doors closed, or either one open or closed. So that's four possibilities. So I could just model it like this, which is a four state, looks like a four state probabilistic of automaton here, if you like. And, um, and then these different layers, I get a different uh, C opt for every one of those modes. Or maybe um, an obstacle, like a, like a sofa, might just appear in front of you. Maybe that doesn't happen too often, but maybe appear or disappear um, in the environment, so it changes modes. That's not exploiting continuity of obstacles in that case, I guess. Um, could be a helicopter landing, I suppose. It may look like that in a two-dimensional projection. Um, it could be that maybe there's just a hazardous situation that all of a sudden happens. So maybe the unpredictability about the future is that it might just start raining, right? So then you change the mode, right? 
and that may change the behavior of everything for your system, but you've captured it with just one mode change. So that might only double the number of states, effectively. And that's, that's really nice. So, um, so maybe this safety or not safety or a giant vehicle approaching panic, you know, something like that, may be enough to capture it. Um, maybe you've suddenly been asked to do something else. That may be the unpredictable aspect of the future. So, so I think these hybrid system models are very useful for modeling. I just wanted to point that out. All right, so I'm going to talk a little bit about game theoretic models. So, so far up to now, the models I've talked about, um, I guess they're, they're more or less um, you know, not paying attention to, to, to the robot, right? So the, the obstacles are moving about, and we're trying to make models of what might happen. Well, in game, under game theory, we'll assume that they respond in some way. So um, maybe I have two or more players. Each one has its own transition equation. You can imagine each one having its own control system, I guess, but the state is the same for everybody in some sense. So everybody, every player in a game can affect the state. If I play a game of, of chess with you, then we're both changing the state as we play, right? So, so it's a kind of game. Um, in, um, in continuous time, um, the state may, uh, includes both player configurations, as I said, if there's two players, or, or everybody's configuration. We can also put velocities in there if you want to move it all into the phase space. I don't care. Um, just makes it harder, but there's no problem writing it down on paper, right? so you can do that. Um, and so this is how a, a, a differential game may look. Um, there's, a, there's a great book by um, Isaacs on differential game theory. He's considered the father of differential game theory. So it's sort of like a control theory meets game theory you know, in that work. There's a lot of interesting examples in that first book in the 19, 1960s that, that kicked off a whole generation of research on these problems. But um, it looks like a control system, but it has two parameters, two inputs, U and V, let's say. And there may be a perfect kind of symmetry in the game. Um, I'll give an example in just a bit. But I just want to say that you can also do it in discrete time. So if you don't want differential equations, then there's uh, two different actions here now, U and V. And the state is xk, but then we transition to xk plus 1. And, um, and that's it. So. Um, so player one might be the, the robot, for example, but player two might be some moving obstacle that's playing some kind of game with you, right? Um, here's a very interesting uh, classical problem. Anyone heard of the homicidal chauffeur? So I, I, I don't know why I don't know why they use the, um, the the French word for driver for for for, for reckless here, but um, but the, the the homicidal chauffeur. So imagine the driver of the car is trying to kill the pedestrian, right? This is the pedestrian. And a pedestrian can move in any direction but with bounded speed. And the car has to act a lot like a Dubin's car. So it's moving forward, but it can go faster than the pedestrian. But there's a catch. You can go faster, but you cannot turn very sharply right, because of the momentum. So the question is, um, does the pedestrian always survive? right? Or alternatively, does the bullfighter always survive? right? the same kind of thing, I think. I believe the bull can, can charge pretty fast, but you, if, if you can jump out of the way quickly enough, you can survive. Well, some people can. Anyway. Um, interestingly enough, I, I, I'm kind of surprised this hadn't been done before. I hadn't seen anything on this, but there's a, there's a paper here I, uh, by uh, Ruiz and Murrieta Sid on um, a homicidal differential drive robot. So if you just replace this part of the model with a differential drive robot, they have a paper that tells you what happens under different conditions, whether or not the robot wins. I can't believe it. You know, differential drives are so common all over robotics. And so that's a perfect robotic differential game. I don't, I don't think it had been studied before. Um, and so it has, um, in order to characterize what happens to these problems, um, you have basically end up, you can do a Montreal's maximum principle, a lot of the optimal control type tools. Um, Hamilton Jacoby Bellman equations become Hamilton Jacoby Isaacs equations in honor of the, the father of differential game theory and that sort of thing. So, so there's a lot of interesting things you can do in there. Anyway, so, so I, I guess motion planning in dynamic environments at some level should include things like the homicidal chauffeur and other classic examples from differential game theory. All right. <coughs> That's good. I think I'm about halfway done with my slides for this part, and I'm about halfway done with the time. I'm going to, let me see, we did, am I doing this right? 12.45 to, I think, no, 12.15 to 3.45. All right. Um, well, what kind of trouble do we get into in game theory? Well, first of all, it, maybe we don't have the right models for the other players, right? So uh, it's always a modeling issue in game theory. 
If I'm engaged in some kind of adversarial situation, do I really know the motives of my opponents and exactly what, what their value, values are, let's say? Um, what, 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 it, what it is that actually costs them or maybe what actions do they have available? I'm not so sure, right? So that's one, one problem we often have in game theory that it requires quite a bit of symmetric modeling. Um, for, for motion planning in dynamic environments, I, I need to know under what conditions can you avoid collision. And um, well, if I start thinking about that again, I may be right back to reachable set computations, which I guess is why I just mentioned Hamilton Jacoby in talking about the differential game. So you may be right back to that problem again, except for some simple kinds of cases. Now, I, I have seen in my own research some kind of examples where you can, you can make some progress in game theory if you can simplify the model enough to make the reachable set computations easy. And uh, one example that, that, that I've worked on, this problem was introduced by Suzuki and Yamashita, is uh, visibility-based pursuit of Asian. So the, 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 um, the pursuer, say, is a robot with an omnidirectional visibility sensor, and then the evader is moving around in the shadows. But I decide not to make the evader model like a um, differential drive or anything like that. I just say, well, the evader moves with unbounded speed. I don't know how fast the evader can go. So if I do that, then I can just treat the reachable set as just this gray region. And then it just kind of behaves like a gas that moves around in a very easy way to characterize, it turns out. We can come up with very clean combinatorial kinds of decompositions. I'll show a little bit of that in the fourth part. But I just want to say that, you know, that, that, that works out very nicely. Now, that only works because this is a game, and I'm assuming that the evader does not want to be seen, right? And, and so it's going to be moving out of the way of me. If I made an unbounded speed model in some other kind of game, like a homicidal chauffeur, then the chauffeur just immediately wins, right? Or whichever one has unbounded speed just immediately wins and is done. So, so you can't really um, do this for problems, for, for all problems. But in this case, just the, the, some little subtleties in the, in the assumptions in the model all of a sudden make it very nicely tractable for computation. So that's just something to pay attention to. That if you, if you overmodel your problem at this level, you might have very complicated reachable sets, but you can come up with a much more effective, elegant solution by simplifying your model. Even if it looks too conservative, the model you have, it may help you a lot. Um, that kind of thing can generalize, by the way, to something we call shadow information spaces, which rather than just keeping track of one target, it can keep track of multiple ones, and, and we can um, um, nicely in a combinatorial way keep track of how those move. I won't talk to the details about that. Though. Um, other kinds of games, um, maybe I have something like the law of the jungle. Maybe I can just make assumptions like um, the smaller bodies just move out of my way, right? Um, but I might still have some difficulty, don't look at the picture yet, but I may still have some difficulty in, I may have an assumption that smaller bodies move out of the way, but I might have to do motion planning and reachable set analysis to make sure that they don't get trapped by my own motions, right? So, so, um, so it's still not completely simple to do that. Um, I started thinking I could probably talk for an hour and a half at least about uh, multiple robot coordination with uh, limited communication, right? Distributed robotics certainly would fit under dynamic environments. I decided not to go that way. I decided to keep this more like motion planning, like the title suggests. But, but certainly when I have multiple robot coordination, it may very much appear like a game because I cannot communicate with all of the other robots. And so maybe we have to develop protocols for interaction and so forth. And uh, it becomes complicated in that way. Um, and even in a fully cooperative setting, um, like for example, one robot wants to move this way, another robot wants to move this way. Which robot goes into the pocket and waits? Um, becomes a trade-off that has to be decided. So even even this kind, of, even in a fully uh, coordinated situation, there are these trade-offs that have to be decided somehow. So even that looks a little bit like dynamic environments to me, but maybe not as central as the previous things we talked about. All right, I'm going to talk about non-obstacles. So, so I, the whole time this has been about motion planning, we've worried a lot about um, collision avoidance, right, and, and finding a path that avoids the obstacle region. But um, I guess when I think about planning in dynamic environments, it's not all about that. So maybe, for example, um, we might have a planetary rover or some outdoor vehicle. And so, OK, I'm not sure what an obstacle is here. There's some places I would rather roll the vehicle over than others. But it's sort of like a continuum of possibilities. It's not as simple as am I going to hit the wall or not, right? So it's just something to pay attention to, that the whole notion of an obstacle gets kind of uh, fuzzy here. Um, Imagine it's like having gray levels of different obstacles. 
and um, um, or something that we may call it a little bit later a cost map that describes what the environment looks like and that may be suitable for different kinds of planning problems. Um, and even whatever it might look like out so it might not be the primary objective. Maybe I'm supposed to manipulate objects in the environment, right? So manipulation you know, is a perfectly valid thing to do. Um, maybe I'm supposed to actually hit all the other bodies. That's called rendezvous, right? So maybe I'm supposed to rendezvous with all the other bodies. Perfectly fine. I just want to point out that a lot of the things we're talking about today, with just a little bit of change in the model, might apply to some of these other kinds of settings. So it's important to think about um, that we're not just talking about uh, avoiding obstacles and that's it. Maybe I want to maintain visibility of moving obstacles. Maybe that's my goal, just to maintain visibility of moving obstacles. So that's a motion planning and dynamic environments problem, but it's not a matter of just simply trying to avoid collision with them. I want to view them. I want it to be like a um, um, like paparazzi or something, moving around, following the obstacle, making sure they're always in view. Um, maybe uh, search and destroy, of course, you can always do that. Um, or uh, maybe I just want to count the number of moving obstacles, and that's all, and I've done my job. Right, so all kinds of different tasks we can do. I guess in general, I can think of any relation over pair over the bodies, right? Like maybe I want them to collide or not collide or see each other or not see each other. All sorts of different interactions you can make. Perfectly fine if, if I think about the space of models for uh, motion planning and dynamic environments. All of those would be perfectly reasonable. Um, all right, so let's think about plan representations. What does a plan look like now? Um, for, for these different kinds of problems. Right, so first of all, um, if the obstacles themselves are not completely predictable, what does that mean? That means that um, I can learn a lot from sensors during execution, right? If the obstacles are perfectly predictable, and if I know the initial configuration, then uh, why do I ever need sensors, right? So, so that, that's perfectly fine. So, so now let's think about it. If um, um, the way the path planning problem and the motion planning problem was formulated so far, it was essentially what we would call offline. You can plan very carefully, you have all the information, think about it, then go and do your job, and um, your perfect predictability, everything's fine. Um, and then your, your, your solution is uh, usually parameterized by time. Right? It's just a, a, a trajectory. We're going to start looking at the online case where um, a plan is requested during execution based on new information, and the planning time is critical. So as information comes in, maybe you keep generating new plans, right? Um, or maybe you're still using the same plan you started with. It's just that the plan itself can respond to new information. And what's the difference between those two is an interesting question. Um, so some terms become important as we go on, and these will be important in the fourth part. Um, dynamic replanning is a term you see a lot. Um, anytime planning, partial planning, um, if you have more of a control background, you may have seen a similar idea of receding horizon control or model predictive controls, another control word for that. So all of these ideas are related, and um, they come up from this problem of benefiting. Well, it's not a problem necessarily, but you can benefit from sensor information obtained online, so you might as well exploit it. So I want to talk about four different kinds of representations a bit here for plans, and uh, then I think we'll be mostly done for this part. So let's look at what I would call time feedback. Most people call this open loop, I guess. I like to call it time feedback. Um, it's implying a perfect time sensor. And right? so at every time, I, 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 you know, I, I, while I'm moving the robot around, I always have this perfect watch, let's say, that tells me exactly the time. And from that, I know exactly where the robot needs to be. Right? So that's what I have as my control. I guess I don't have it formulated as a control system here, because I do not have differential constraints in this formulation. So it works out very nicely. Um, so, 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 so that's one possibility here. But as we said, we have to do these complicated uh, reachable set computations to obtain the free parts of the um, configuration space of the state time, sorry, configuration time space. And it might be the case that it's uh, such a severe over approximation of what might actually happen in reality that we're in trouble. And um, it might be that we can't perfectly control a robot like this, as I said. And um, the big problem we're going to deal with, as I just said, is what if new information is sensed about obstacles? So that will make that not a very nice solution. We could do configuration feedback. Um, in my book, I refer to this as uh, feedback motion planning. Um, that's in um, chapter 8 of my book. And um, 
the idea is instead of computing a path, why don't you compute a vector field over the configuration space? And this is just over the configuration space, not over the phase space, which is normally what's done in, in a control. So if you want to use this along with a control system, then what you're going to do is track the vector field as opposed to tracking one particular path. And I think that gives more flexibility in a lot of ways. And um, you know, the idea of producing a vector field um, certainly goes back to people considering uh, potential functions. And uh, um, you, know, you, could, you could look at that T's potential function methods. You could look at um, Limon and Kodachek's um, navigation functions. And you might as well just go all the way back to uh, the alcohol functions and such, which most of these things are inspired by. And um, what do we do with those? We usually take a gradient, which produces the direction you're supposed to move. So I just like to look at it directly as producing a vector field. Because you can actually have a lot more flexibility in producing vector fields computationally if you do not worry about making some kind of navigation function a priori. I think it's much more efficient in implementation to just directly assign vector fields however you like. So, um, um, so, um, so that's one possibility. We, we, we've developed some methods on this, and other people have as well, for computing collision-free vector fields and such. Um, um, I, I'm not going to go into details of that, but I just want to say that having state feedback, or sorry, configuration feedback, um, gives you a lot of flexibility if there's unpredictability over time. For example, maybe I'm moving the robot along some path here. Maybe I have to do some unexpected avoidance maneuver, which is a separate module. And then when I'm done, maybe I'm somewhere else at the end of that. But I still know how to continue to the goal. So a representation like this may be more robust to some unexpected occurrences. So that's one thing to think about for representation. Yeah, that's how it looks in big mode. Sorry. So um, moving into the phase space, of course, uh, makes natural sense, as I talked about before. And then why don't we just make a state feedback control law? Note that most state feedback control laws do not directly account for obstacles, right? That's um, kind of mixing the, the evils of both problems together. You can have nonlinear systems and obstacles all thrown into one, which is sort of bad enough. But, um, um, but that's the way the representation looks. And I just want to point out that in order to make a state feedback control law, we're assuming that the state can be accurately sensed at all times, and this includes velocities, right? Maybe uh, your favorite uh, filter, common filter, maybe an extended common filter will, will work for you if you're lucky. Um, maybe some kind of particle filters will work. But, but, the, um, but the point is that in order to do state feedback, I just want to point out that the information requirements are very high and that you need to know what the current state is. And what might the state be? Well, remember again at the beginning of this part, I said the state could include the configuration and velocity of the obstacles, your own configuration and velocity. There's a lot of information out there, an exact geometric representation of the walls and such, which I'll talk about in a bit. So it could include a lot of information. And the question I ask is, is that information really necessary for solving your problem? Right? It, it might not be. Maybe you can get away with much less information when you're sensing. So that's uh, one thing I like to look at. Let me, um, Talk about that energy planning, and then and then um, I'll go on. So this one again has many different names, but um, I'll, I'll give I think probably better examples of it in the next part. But uh, let me give a little bit here. So um, imagine I have some kind of infinite horizon problem. So I can imagine I have a, some kind of nice transition model here. I keep getting next states and next states and next states after um, applying these actions u1, u2, u3, and so forth. I have a kind of cost functional here. Uh, imagine I'm trying to get to some uh, goal region, and so this is a goal region in the, in the state space. There's an obstacle region in the state space, and I could just say that the cost term that I pay each time, uh, maybe it's zero if I'm in the goal, so I'm happy I never pay. If I ever hit an obstacle, I pay infinite cost so that I never choose that action. And otherwise, I'll just get some other term here, which let's say is some kind of nice just to make this example work a little bit, nothing fancy about it, just some um, heuristic underestimate of the distance to the goal. So um, the same kind of estimate that you might use in A star search or something, let's say. So, um, so if that's the case, if I'm, if I'm selecting good actions, the, the D should go down, right? I should get close to the goal. So I, so I keep paying less and less, so I have some incentive to move towards what I think is the goal. Ultimately, I have to get to the goal if I want to avoid paying infinite cost, right? So if you want to solve something like that, and I'll give more geometric kinds of examples in the next part, but I just want to say the way that might look is I have a window size, let's say, of n steps. All right, so this is the receding horizon idea. 
there's some number of steps, and that's as far as I'm going to calculate into the future, right, with my models. Again, yeah, maybe I do um, reachable set computations even to implement this. You know, whatever you're going to do, you're just going to look ahead some number of steps. So let's say we look ahead n steps, and then I try to find a, a optimal sequence of actions that optimizes this cost over that, over that uh, period. And then I apply that. I don't apply the whole thing, no, no. I only apply the first action. Because as soon as I'm done applying the first action, I will also be taking into account new information about the obstacles and sliding my window forward one step and just doing the same thing again. So I keep moving my, so, so, so what am I doing? I'm, count, I'm looking at a policy, or well, in this case, just a sequence of actions that's n steps into the future. I take that sequence, execute the first step of it, and then I do the whole thing over again. So now I'm looking n steps into the future again. I have a new sequence, and I take the first step of that one. And I keep doing that and doing that. So that's the, um, one example of the receding horizon idea, and um, um, that's um, that kind of idea. It shows up in control a lot. In control, people are usually using it to handle the problems of nonlinear systems, among other things, and, and um, um, they, they may move forward um, um, with, with um, um, well, I'll just leave it at that. They're using it often to handle problems of nonlinearity, but um, um, for us, we're doing it to handle problems of not being able to look too far into the future and compute what's going to happen to, to figure out the optimal strategy. All right, so, so this goes on and on, I guess, as I said, just a few steps there. Um, it's interesting to think about. Remember, I'm back to this, uh, this problem again with the demon. So um, does this lead to globally optimal solutions? Well, people in, in control know that it doesn't, and people in robotics assume that it doesn't, too, I think. Another thing which people in control always ask, and we should ask in robotics as well here, uh, is um, does it even produce stable motions, right? So if I do this receding horizon idea, I could get into trouble if this door starts moving back and forth. It may be possible to trap the robot into some oscillation. Okay. Um, now, if we had uh, probabilistic laws and we um, look far enough into the future, maybe we can overcome this. Right, so, so finally, the more general case is um, information feedback. And I just want to say that that's, that's where you have probably the, the most difficulties in terms of design. But these are where the most clever strategies tend to exist or live. Um, so the optical region is not completely known. Um, even representation of the portions of it might be hard. I might not even know the robot configuration. may not know the, the, the location of the static obstacles that aren't even moving. And so information is coming in from sensors. I want to understand what, what representations can I um, maintain reliably and efficiently. And um, I want to just think about the task. The task is very important. Whatever it is I'm trying to solve, I want to think about what representations are actually necessary. Right? It may be sufficient to build a complete map and understand where all the obstacles are at all times, but is that really necessary for your task? Because if it's not necessary, you should choose not to model it, right? And then choose not to make sensors estimate it. So that's the kind of idea here. And maybe you can even give some performance guarantees in spite of the missing information, the information that's not relevant to your test. So that's something I want to, I want to talk about a little bit in this, in this last uh, part. And then I will um, give another homework problem, of course, for those of you who remember the, the morning ones. Um, all right. Well, here's a common kind of structure. So I'm going to start to expand the state space a little bit here and think about this. And uh, um, this is closer to stuff I've been thinking about a lot after I wrote the motion planning out of this book, I've been thinking a lot about uh, sensing and information spaces and things like that. And I think it does have some bearing on the motion planning and dynamic environment problem, so I'll sort of say how I think it's related here in this little part. Um, so here's a common structure that's going to happen. We're going to make bigger state spaces now. This is a different z-space than what we had before. Um, and um, you may have heard of the SLAM problem, of course. So you have, um, you have what, the problem of localization and mapping. So maybe there's a, there's a set of possible configurations. That's a localization problem. Maybe there's a set of possible environments. I call that a mapping problem. And of course, when we consider both together, we have in configuration environment pairs. So the kind of state spaces we find ourselves in, and these are the kind of state spaces you find in SLAM all the time, is uh, something like this, where you have, a, um, um, you, 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 have, you have a collection that's a set of sets. So one element of that is called the map. And then an element of the element, right, the, the small z here, would be a place in the map, right? 
So you're always, you're always having this kind of situation, right? In other words, I have uh, one of my maps might describe exactly where all the walls are here, and then the configuration talks about where the robot is inside of that map, right? So it, it's the map together with the you are here indicator right? that shows where the robot is, including its orientation. Um, so if that's the case, if we don't know the configuration or the map, we tend to have pairs like this. Configuration and map, and the configuration needs to be inside of the map, and the map needs to be inside of my, oh, let's say atlas of maps, if you like. That's a common kind of structure. Let me talk about that a little bit. So, um, so maybe there's a gigantic state space. It's a subset of some configuration space for what, like many of the examples we gave this morning. And then I have a set of possible maps or environments. So maybe, maybe it only has five of them. Maybe there's five different floor plans that I gave to the robot. And I tell it it's in one of those five, and that's all it knows. So X now would be the set of all configurations together with environments for which the position of the robot is inside of the environment, let's say, if it's a 2D example there. And the environment is in this collection. So that's the common structure that I showed in the last slide. Um, I like to consider infinite families of maps, very large families, that are very simple to describe. So for example, maybe it's more or less, let's say, all polygonal subsets of the, of the plane or of R3, uh, polyhedral subsets of R3, for example. A um, bunch more here. Uh, maybe it's a set of all bitmap representations. So this could be an enormous collection of possible environments. But I think it's very nice to reason about these things especially in such a way so that I do not have to make an explicit encoding about any one particular environment. Um, if you want to do probabilistic reasoning, then you may be forced to put a probability distribution over some collection like this, which um, well, at, the, at, the, at least has a lot of uh, measure theoretic difficulties, let's say. It's not very easy to put uh, pro reasonable probability densities on these kinds of spaces. Um, it can be done in different situations, but it's, it's not so easy. Um, it's very restrictive, let's say. Um, well, I have some kind of sensing model, and um, I'm trying to build up some little bit of concepts and tools here so that I can describe what's going to be information feedback, right? So a plan that's just using information rather than states or configurations or um, time. Those are just examples of information, but I want to make it more general. So, um, so I have my giant state space, and then I have what's called an observation space. That's just a standard sensor mapping. You can make other kinds that incorporate other stuff. But this just takes states and converts them to observations. And then, um, so that's all that happens. So I have y equals h of x. That gives me an observation. I could make a probabilistic noisy version if you want. That's fine. I may even want to make it over the state time space that I defined before, but I, I'm not going to do that here. And the important thing I like to think about are pre-images of these mappings. So I might measure, um, get some observation, and then when I look at the pre-image, it's going to be the set of all states that have the same observation. So in terms of uncertainty, all you're doing in some sense, I always think that a sensor is like a bread slicer. You're just chopping up the uh, state space into these slices, and inside of each slice you cannot distinguish based on your sensor. In other words, when I get an observation, when I look at the pre-image, all those states map to the same observation, so there's no way to distinguish them. That's a huge amount of uncertainty, even before you put probabilities on top of it. That's a huge amount of uncertainty that's due to ambiguity. And it might be in your best interest, even for a problem that involves motion planning in dynamic environments, it may be in your best interest to leave some part of the state space ambiguous. Like you can't measure it with a sensor because it doesn't matter. It might not be relevant to your task. If that's the case, you've made a much more maybe robust and effective system. It may be efficient because it doesn't have to model as much. That's the kind of general idea. Here's a very simple example. Suppose I have n bodies that move around in R2, so they're moving around. Um, so my state space would be R2N, and maybe I have an observation, I have a sensor, it's just like a detection region, maybe there's a camera, and all it tells me is the number of bodies that are in view. So it only has then, if there are uh, four bodies total, let's say for this example, then there's only five possible outputs for the sensor. So the equivalence classes that I get of um, states, remember I said that a sensor looks like a bread slicer, so my slices of bread here are just these particular cases. I don't care where the bodies are in particular in these regions, or when they're outside, I don't care where they're at. Just with respect to the field of view of my camera, all I care about is the number that are in view. And maybe that's enough to solve your problem, right? In involving dynamic environments. Just to have a sensor as simple as that, right? And that, that would be great. So it's something to think about. All these things kind of 
come together. This is kind of too compressed, I would say, about these, these sensing problems and stuff to give the full idea. But I just want to say that there's, there's a lot to be done in this direction of carefully modeling the, the, the sensors and trying to achieve some kind of minimalism so that you don't have to compute, let's say, some kind of horrendous reachable sets and figure out the state at all times to solve the problem. For example, maybe your problem can be solved by just simple sensor feedback. I'm not sure what flying insects actually do, but, but, uh, but I imagine they might. I, I know no biology, so I don't claim anything. But I'm just saying, maybe here's a, here's a plan, and it just takes the output of the sensors and directly specifies the action or input from that, right? Just perfect sensor feedback. So that's another kind of plan representation, right? Um, you see this a lot. People in a lot of swarm robotics use representations like that. Um, distributed robotics, swarm robotics. Maybe you see it in emergent behavior. It could be the idea behind uh, behavior-based robotics, right, to a large extent. So um, perfectly fine. Um, so, so that's one possibility at another extreme, right? Just take the sensor readings. Maybe you have something as simple as this, but it makes you decide how to move your robot. So if you can get away with it and that solves your task, do it, right? Why not? Then you don't have to build any extra representations. But the question really is, what do you need to remember in between? So for all the cases in between where um, you don't want to build a full state representation and you cannot get away with just sensor feedback, what should you build in between, right? Well, what should you remember? I can remember all of the actions that were applied, and I can remember all of the observations. So what should I do with that? Well, you should make some kind of filter that takes that information and transforms it in some way. So I will say that whatever your filter is doing, I will say that it's doing computations over an information space. So basically, we have some kind of filter. I call it a function here. It's a transition function. So it will take whatever the previous information state. This information could be anything. It could be a partial representation of a map. Um, it could be a, a representation of the configuration or some combination of those. Whatever it's encoding, I just take my new sensor observation, my new action, and I update to get a new information state. So that's the way the filters look that we, that we use. And uh, I'll, I'll show you a little bit of, I'll show you familiar examples of this in just a bit. The common filter works like that, for example, just to give one. So what I want to say is that using filtering is from the robot's perspective, we're living now in that information space. You don't ever try to reconstruct the state, although the common filter is designed for that, so, so you can in that case, but you might not need to in general. Um, so if I do that, then I can just say I have an information feedback plan. Whatever my filter is running, the information states there produce the actions. Right? And that's, to me, the most general kind of plan. Everything I've talked about so far is a special case of that. So I could have uh, state feedback, in which case the plan here is just a states go to actions. If I want to do that, I need to make a filter that estimates the state. So a, a, a common filter might do that. right? So it gives me a state estimate. And then I, from that, I can make a plan. But the common filter gives you more than that, right? What else do you get? Covariance, right? So, so maybe I can make a plan that uses both the mean and covariance as, as, as feedback. Right? So as I get more uncertain about the position of the robot or of the obstacle, I choose a different action, right? So, so that's the thing to think about. The, the domain of the plan in the most general setting is an information space. And so, um, so it could be, it could look like a state space, could look like mean and covariance, a space of all of those, if you're, if you're common filter oriented, let's say. Um, the the, the so-called open loop case um, could be that um, I just assign natural numbers to each one of my actions, or just a time index, right? The time feedback that I talked about, that's, this is a discrete version of the time feedback. So the information states here are just time or what step or what stage we're at. Um, this was sensor feedback. It's another example. I, again, I, I can put them all in this, in, the, in this form that I just gave a bit ago of these uh, filter transitions here. Um, I can put them all in this kind of nice form. Of course, the, um, the sensor feedback one's kind of trivial, right? Phi of all of this stuff just equals yk, correct? Right, so it's a very trivial kind of filter. <laughs> Nevertheless, I can put that in like that. Uh, there's also a history feedback, which actually in this case I can just say, remember everything and base your decision off of that. All right, so that's the full extreme. In other words, the filter in this case will just take these and concatenate them onto a really long vector of everything we remember observing and do no transformations to it at all. If that works for you, great, you know, but, but it's, it's, uh, it's hard to use that in raw form. But in some sense, that is the, the biggest information space you can have because 
that covers all of the information you've received. Are there any questions about this so far? How's the, how's the post-lunch sleepiness? Okay. And jet lag for many of you, I'm sure. So I, I don't have much jet lag coming from Illinois. We're in the same uh, time zone here. So. All right. Um, here's a couple more examples that hopefully should be familiar to people here. Um, I could do uh, belief feedback. Um, belief meaning probability density function over the state space. So um, people often call it belief space in that case, uh, especially uh, people closer to AI, I think, in um, stochastic systems and such. Um, Call it reasoning with imperfect state information. Maybe you talk about uh, PDFs over that. Over that. So, um, so for example, this is the remember this is the history of actions and this is the history of observations. That's all on the condition, and that's a density of uh, state, right? So I can say that every element of this probabilistic information space here. That's what I intend to refer to them as, is a probability density function, and then my plan is a mapping from probability densities to actions. So that's not bad. It's a very neat way to think, maybe, right? So for every PDF, I specify an action. Hopefully, I can group a bunch of those together and do the same action for whole collections of those, right? Because obviously, um, well, without too much care, you could be in an infinite dimensional space very quickly, right? And then cause a lot of trouble. Um, well, if everything's Gaussian, if you're in linear Gaussian land, then, uh, then uh, well, then the probabilistic information space becomes what? The space of all Gaussians which is parameterizable by mean and covariance alone, right? And then, then, you're, then it's nice, you're back to some, you know, even this kind of feedback here does not look as bad, which is partly why the Kalman filter works so well. Um, all right. In general, if you don't have nice linear Gaussian land, then you could say that these transitions in the filter, again, it's a filter, going back to this mode here, I'm just talking about the same thing here. What happens in the probabilistic case is that I get a new PDF based on the previous PDF and the new observation and the new um, action. That's exactly called Bayesian filtering, right? So um, you, you can look at the, the book by uh, uh, Thrun, Fox, and Burghardt, for example, on probabilistic robotics, uh, lots of other places, but it's exactly those Bayesian filters. I, I cover that some in my book as well. Um, and uh, sometimes people refer to versions of this as uh, POM DPs. Um, Note there's also a perfectly analogous set-based version, which is the non-deterministic information space. And in this case, um, the elements are, are subsets of the state space. So based on all sensor observations and all um, actions, I can derive a, a, a minimal subset of, of possible states that the system is in after this information. And then you can make a, 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 a plan that's defined using feedback on that space. So that basically if you're if you're in this if you have this set of possible states, you do that action and so forth. So um, so that's exactly the non-deterministic analog of this, which is non-deterministic filtering. So if you know Bayesian filtering pretty well, then I can say that um, how does Bayesian filtering work? Right? It has two steps. Whenever I take into account the action, you do marginalization, right? There's a marginalization step. Kind of like takes, in most cases, it'll take your distribution and make it more diffuse, right? Uh, makes the entropy go up, typically, unless you're running into a wall, in which case it goes down. But that, that's something. Um, so, so you have one step that's marginalization, and the next step is Bayes' rule whenever you get a new observation, right? So in the set-based case, marginalization is replaced by union. There's a set of places where you, where you might go for each possible state you could be in, so you just union all the possibilities together. And then the step that's, that's Bayes' rule in Bayesian filtering becomes intersection in the deterministic case. So based on my sensor reading, I look at the pre-image, and I just intersect that with the set of places where I might be. So it's very acute, I think. Marginalization becomes union, and Bayes' rule becomes intersection. And, and these computations, for some models, might be very neat and efficient. So it's something to pay attention to. I think um, a lot of people have memories going back to the 1980s of anything involving sets being uh, very, very difficult. And that's because of a lot of the heavy machinery that was used in computational real algebraic geometry. However, um, reachable set computations for some of these kinds of problems might be very easy, like the pursuit evasion one that I showed you. So it really depends, and, and you really should think about these things carefully, I think. Um, all right. Um, 
So what other possibilities are there? Well, I don't know. I just made up a few more, maybe. Um, the information space can be a space of location and topological map pairs, right? So maybe I have different topological maps that are possible for the environment and locations in those topological maps. Maybe I have some kind of coordinates for the target that I'm trying to track. Maybe I have these things called uh, gap navigation trees, which um, are kind of minimalist representations that you can learn in um, planar environments for doing optimal navigation, but they don't have uh, distance measurements encoded in them or any kind of exact geometry. Um, maybe a kind of space of multi-resolution bitmaps with configurations inside of those bitmaps, right? So, so these are different possibilities. And essentially, these things will come up in the, in the fourth part of this talk. But I will not be formally referring to them with all of this notation and talking about information states and stuff like that. But I just want to point out that I think that's very critical for these problems that involve um, motion planning and dynamic environments. You have to reason about what information state should be um, gathered and maintained from your sensors in order to solve your task. Because that will help you a lot in the modeling if you can figure that out. So the overall process, you may have the system you're trying to design, which includes the robots, moving bodies, the environment, and whatever sensors. And we put everything together. We get some kind of state space and sensor mappings and a control system or transition function. And then we think about now very carefully, what should the information space be? All of this, by the way, I forgot to mention, all these steps can only start with a task. So based on your task, if you're not sure what the task is, then you might as well make your robot gather information on everything, I guess. If you're not really sure what you're doing, right? But if you know what the task is, if your task is just to clean the floors, right? The, the robot's a good example of that. It doesn't gather too much information. I'm fairly sure it's not building a complicated map of your house every time it vacuums the floor, right? So, um, so, so it's using, I think, very small amounts of internal state information. So when you get down to these steps then, find an information space for which you can practically compute a filter. I can make a trivial information space that only has one information state. And then we just stay there the whole time, but it's useless. So you've got to try to make this space as small as possible, but still sufficient for solving your task. And then whatever the goal is, it'll have to be expressed in terms of information states so that you can actually know that it's being solved, or you don't know if the task is even being, being accomplished if you can't reason about it directly in the information space. And then we compute this information feedback plan, as I said. And really, this is not sequential. This is all part of the design process. And I think any attempt to modularize this too much will, um, will drive the information requirements artificially high. I think that's something that's happened to motion planning going back to the earliest days, is that the problem of gathering the information, right, has been trivialized. Assume you have a perfect map of everything, right? That's how the motion planning problem starts. And as everybody knows who works in robotics, um, well, and, and back in the day, they didn't have, um, let's say, uh, connect sensors to go and gather all the data for you. Usually it was gathered by graduate students and tape measures and things like that, right? So it was a lot of work to even get the data. So um, um, you should really think about where does the information come from. And if, all, if you can, at all costs, try to avoid gathering it all. Even in this modern times when you can sense everything and get a ridiculous amount of data, you still have the problem of figuring out what to actually keep in your filter, what to actually do computation over, and, and, and how much modeling to do on that to try to make a robot that's effective in a dynamic environment. So I think these issues become very important in that setting. Um, all right, remember the fundamental limitations. As I said, I, I already did this slide. I just want to remind you of this. I'm just kind of finishing up now. Um, so we could have this movable wall, and uh, we could have a demon that always prevents the robot from moving. That would be a game theoretic kind of model now, I could say. But if the thing, if the door here moves stochastically and it's not conditioned on the position of the robot, then I can just wait by one of one of these to the top or the bottom and then just jump whenever I have my chance, right? So that's something to think about. So, so the choice of model and what you assume about the world greatly affects what you can accomplish. So no uh, receding horizon model is going to solve this unless you have some more information about, um, about what this wall is going to do. Um, I think in, in the choice of these models, I think we have to ask ourselves, what are we looking for? I just decided to make up a list of what I think are different people's views on what might make a good solution. Maybe it's a good solution if it makes a nice demo, right? Maybe it's a good solution if it makes a nice simulated demo. It's a little weaker, I guess. By demo, I mean a real you know, robot demo, right? Um, but you know, even better is maybe it works robustly and reliably in an actual deployed system. 
maybe even one that makes money for somebody, right? I mean, that, that's pretty good. That's a pretty good level of accomplishment. Um, I, I tend to like this one from time to time. It's nice to have some theorems that imply that it works, right? Correctly under, under the, you know, the modeling assumptions. Um, the best, of course, is when it all happens together. They have some theorems that imply correctness and it really does work in the system. Many times it's almost too much to ask for, but, but um, I just wanted to point this out. So depending on which one of these you select, you may then go and select different kinds of models inside of here, right? And you might want to think about what your goals are, really. Right? But I would argue that if you want to make more robust, reliable kinds of systems, you should try to minimize the amount of modeling assumptions in here if you can. So understand your task very well and try to make models that are simpler. Don't get into some ridiculous amount of reachable set computations if you don't need to, or sensors that have to measure everything if you don't need to. So that's the kind of thing I would advise them. And we also have the issue that shows up a lot in planning. Planning people usually care more about feasibility, give me a plan that works, rather than optimality. In control, people talk about optimality a lot because um, for a lot of control problems, it's kind of trivial to make a non-optimal control law that it will eventually work but, but doesn't um, you know, get you to where you want to go, but does it in a horrible way. But for most of our planning algorithms, essentially almost any solution they produce is good enough for us. It, it tends to work like that. And, and the biggest problem is just getting through the obstacles. And if you try to optimize the paths, you might get too close to the obstacles anyway, and then we don't like that either. So, um, so, so that's why we tend to focus on feasibility more historically. Um, this is something to think about. I like this picture because it uh, shows the different kinds of modeling choices. So this was the static environment over time. This is z-space again. Maybe it's predictable, so some obstacle moves around. This is a one-dimensional C space now. Maybe we have bounded uncertainty, so we have an initial location where we think the, the obstacle might be, and then with bounded uncertainty, we get a kind of cone. Or maybe we have probabilistic models, in which case you can do some kind of uh, maybe stochastic simulation to try to uh, model what's going to happen in the future. So I think these are the, um, well, there's the static case, and then there's three choices here. You may have no choice, though. Probably your environment's unpredictable, in which case you think about these two possibilities very carefully. But of course, all of this is, let's say, kind of an issue that's orthogonal or independent of um, what information to use for feedback. That becomes very critical. All right, so um, I talked about calculating forward projections. Um, by forward projections, I mean these. Um, Remember to think about how the other bodies respond to your motion. Is, are we talking about a game? Maybe it's cooperative, maybe it's non-cooperative, maybe the obstacles are just oblivious to what you're doing. There's other kinds of interactions. Maybe the goal is to actually rendezvous um, or just maintain visibility. Maybe there's hard versus soft obstacles. Maybe you can run over the top of obstacles. Um, you know, if you're a giant outdoor vehicle, Maybe obstacles are not a problem, right? but maybe a lake is a problem. And I don't know. There's different ways of thinking about it. So maybe that's an obstacle in the hard sense, but you can run over most terrain, perhaps. Um, there's limitations of replanning. That's going to come up again in the next part, but just this, this Beenan example that I showed you, I just want you to think about that. Um, and um, a big part, which I, I, wish, I wish I could talk for, for, for hours and hours about this part, is what kind of information feedback. So, um, um, and and um, um, I, I won't talk more about that. I, I did, um, if you look at my web page, I have a, um, um, a, a short book or booklet on uh, sensing and filtering, which um, covers some of these kinds of planned representation issues and such. You might find interesting, perhaps, in filtering and things. Um, it just, I just posted that about a week ago. So I'm trying to work on a longer book version, but we'll see. I no promises. I don't know. Uh, let's see. Uh, now it's time for the homework problem. Um, how should the chicken cross the road? I know it looks like a terrible joke, but um, uh, let's see here. So this is a dynamic environments problem. And um, the chicken starts here. This is in the plane. And the chicken would like to go over here. Maybe there's some food or something. I don't know. Are chickens smart enough to do that? I don't know. Um, and um, well, there, there, this is one of these kind of problems that has uh, where the environment has two modes. So over here, I think way back, I don't know how far back I have to go. Oh, maybe too far. Uh, where did I talk about hybrid systems? No, no. I think it was in here somewhere. Okay, way too far back to where I did. Oh, there it is. Yep. I talked about this, right? So imagine the environment has two modes, safe or dangerous. And that's the idea. Oh, what's the end button? All right, who knows? Let's see. Um, well, 
So there's two modes, safe or danger. If you're in safe mode, then um, you know, the, the chicken moves, it's omnidirectional and it moves with constant speed. So all I care about is the path length that it takes. And it would like to go there. So if the environment's always safe, you might as well just move along the straight line, okay? But if the environment becomes dangerous at some time in the future, then suppose it's right here and the environment becomes dangerous. It has to dash to the other side. This is a lot like uh, jaywalking or something, right? So, so if, if, um, if you're out on the street and there's traffic and you want to run across the street, what path should you take, right? I don't encourage that, right? There's nobody from Germany listening. I, I know some cultures people despise jaywalkers a lot. But, but anyway, um, so, what, so, 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 what, so, what is, what is the path you, you should, you should walk on this, right? And um, um, the question is, should the, should the chicken, if it wants to minimize the expected length of the path that it takes, should it walk straight from QI to QG? Should it just dash with angle gamma here and then go across? Or should it do something in between? So just something to think about. I, I don't think you'll be able to figure out too precisely, but I would like you to think about what should happen. And I have a probabilistic characterization. So I say that the environment may become dangerous with a, with a plus on arrival parameter here. So in other words, it's like as if I'm tossing a biased coin every microsecond. And at some point when I get heads, the environment becomes dangerous. But I bias the coin so that this will not happen very frequently. Right? But, but it is an important parameter. So I'd like you to figure out what strategy, this is a dynamic environment problem, minimizes the expected distance traveled by the chicken. Um, you can think about this the next time you cross roads in traffic, too. It's, it's kind of related. Or play the game Frogger. All right. Uh, thank you. Let's uh, start back at um, 4.15.